So uh, thank you very much for being here. We had a beautiful chat uh, about six months ago right. in Malta. We are back in Malta. And I would like you to start telling me what happened since then. Well, first of all, it's very good to see you again. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was six months ago. So I guess on a personal note, got married. Oh, congratulations. So maybe it's because of that chat. Maybe you put me on the right track. Oh. So you, you can take all the credit. Uh, what's happened? They, you know, I, I think last, you know, during that last conference, we were right in the middle of the crypto winter. You know, Bitcoin was down. Projects were flailing around. The ICO model was coming under intense assaults, if not dead. Yet that conference was very well attended and there was a lot of energy there. So there's an interesting tension, if you will, between what was going on in the market and then what we were experiencing on the ground. The, um, I remember, I think it was the last day of April, I posted something on Facebook or LinkedIn or somewhere where I said, you know, I, I bet the market's about to turn around because I'm getting a lot more inquiries for crypto and blockchain related work. And the very next, like 12 hours later, Bitcoin went up $500. I was like, wow, I, really, I, I wish I'd followed my own investment advice, you know, um, and then it kept on going up since then. Now, of course, you know, Bitcoin's not the entire market. Bitcoin isn't blockchain. It's not the entire market, but it's a really good indicator of people's renewed interest and in the way that everything is solidifying. And uh, the BitConnect guy is back. So is that a good sign too? BitConnect. Uh, <laughs> if they gave me to be a spokesperson, maybe. Otherwise, probably not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. They, I, I, I wouldn't hang your hat on BitConnect, but you never know. Uh, I, I think what's developed is the regulatory interest is still there. You still have jurisdictions like Malta and others putting in new law. Um, they seem to be broadening their focus. So it's going beyond blockchain and crypto per se. It's including AI and DAOs, you know, autonomous organizations. So let, let's talk about that a little bit, because you, of course, mm -hmm. uh, are a lawyer first, and then you discovered blockchain second. But uh, the need for giving a sound regulatory basis to emerging innovation mm -hmm. uh, is across any technology. So uh, from the perspective of, 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 of a legal person, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, how should regulators avoid the mistakes that for the past several years um, uh, crippled, at least to some degree, uh, the ability of uh, honest projects to deliver their promise because of the uncertainty? Well, let me just add one thing. I had I'd actually stopped practicing law and went back into law because of blockchain. So that, that's how passionate I am about it. And I... It's, I, I made the connection that blockchain needs law and law needs blockchain. Like, you know, the, the, the law needs to be rescued from the current state of law, which feeds into your question. There's, it, it's troubling. I mean, we, we have, especially in, in the United States, we have securities laws, for example, and money transmitter laws, banking laws, really, that were put in place in response to the Great Depression and the stock market crash. They're inherently conservative. And they're designed, I think, properly to protect the small investor. But they're based on, they're premised on a paper world, you know, a world of slow moving commerce, a world of, to some extent, personal or private transactions between people who know each other one way or another. The, now, things, of course, got updated before blockchain and crypto happened, but there's th those models still echo through throughout the regulation. And it's a real problem because it, you know, the, the the biggest capitalist market in the world that still allows blockchain and crypto is the U.S. I mean, that's where you have a lot of customers. That's where you have a lot of investment money. And it's one of the most conservative markets. It really causes, makes things slow down. Now, I think there's a, I don't, I don't know if the U.S. will voluntarily loosen up or relinquish its control. And, you know, I'm American. I'm happy to be American. Love my country, all that other good stuff. But I think it's fair to say I'm not thrilled with the way it's approaching this industry. And I think it's a net negative. I think I personally think they have to be forced to do the right thing. And there's two things forcing them. There's the Internet and they, they play with each other. There's the fact that you have all these smaller, in quotes, jurisdictions that are pressing ahead with putting in new and better law. So, you know, Malta is a prime example. I mean, you, from a geographical point of view, it's teeny. I mean, 
Sicily could have invaded the country and win in 12 hours or less. You know, but the but in terms of his global impact, it's huge. I mean, it might as well be you know a superpower. And what lets a small jurisdiction like Malta be huge? Well, it's the international electronic, you know, it's, it's beyond international, it's global or planetary nature of this technology. It lets smaller jurisdictions force the hand of larger jurisdictions in a way that couldn't have been done prior to this technology. You could say that there was a kind of an exclusive relationship between mm -hmm. people and the nation state that they belonged to, they were subject of, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, the internet first and blockchain second uh, really broke down mm -hmm. uh, this uh, assumption exposing large and small uh, jurisdictions to the same kind of pressure mm -hmm. where the smaller ones are nimbler mm -hmm. and then can adapt to the pressure more rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the competition is going to increase rather than decrease. So this pressure is going to be even, even larger mm -hmm. and more and more parts of uh, the formerly monolithic government uh, uh, or state versus individual relationships are going to be broken uh, down and, 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 and nibbled away mm -hmm. by new kinds of services that potentially serve the individual better uh, than not the previous system. I, I think that's true. I, I think this has actually been going on for a long time. The, the, the affordability and availability of travel, uh, which was, you know, in human history, new. You know, the fact that we can fly anywhere quickly, um, the fact that we kind of had a, almost a global currency in the form of the dollar for a while. You know, most of the U.S. dollars are outside the United States. The fact that English has become um, a very available language worldwide. I mean, the, 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 all of these barriers yeah, the, have been the shipping, yeah. the shipping container. Mm -hmm. That yes. represents a packetized uh, uh, matter transport system based on based on the the, the, the oceans connecting all mm -hmm. the continents. Yeah, I mean, you know, all these we we kind of come into a standardized world to a certain extent, or a standardized available world. And the more things become standardized, the more things become available, the less relevant national differences become. And then people go, well, what's the difference if I'm in Malta or if I'm in the US or I'm in Germany. I mean, I can, I still have Netflix. I still have Visa. I still have Skype. You know, it's like, what, what's, what's the difference anymore? Now, there's obviously a huge um, pushback against that. You can see a lot of nationalist movements forming because they're resisting this globalist trend. But just purely from an individual perspective, the, the self-sovereign identity, the, a sovereignty that's separate from the state, you know, a citizenship of yourself, is becoming a real thing. You know, and it's interesting you use the word subject. You know, there's the classical distinction between a subject and a citizen. Um, and the Western democracies sort of pride themselves on the citizenship model. But when you force people to stay within your model and say you cannot leave easily, you can't easily come or you can't leave. It's one thing to say you can't, won't let everyone in because that's, I think, the right of every country to, to meet her who comes in. But to make the rules so you can't easily go that's more like a subject model and less like a citizen model. Uh, so, so you are not very much in agreement with the IRS that uh, communicates to the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. when an American subject owes uh, more than a given amount of tax money. And as a consequence, their passport is uh, made void when they try to leave. I, got, I have mixed feelings about that. The, you know, there's a the classic statement that you know, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. And there's a lot to that. I mean, you know, you can not pay taxes and then not have civilization. The, the countries that get away with not having direct taxes almost always have a tariff model or almost always have a licensing model. I mean, one way or another, the government's paying for itself. So I'm, I'm OK with taxes. I think everyone has an issue when taxes are excessive or spent in a way they don't appreciate the, um, You know, and the U.S. takes away passports for parents who owe child support and haven't paid it. And there's a good argument for that. Um, the, you know, you, you, of course, again, the, the ability to tax is the ability to destroy. So if you tax too much, you're effectively destroying something or you're, you're doing regulation through the back door. So like everything else, it depends on how much in the context. But suppose someone doesn't owe taxes. Suppose someone has fulfilled their obligations and those obligations are reasonable. To, to control their exit 
and have them nonetheless owe taxes for a number of years or look at them funny when they set up offshore entities or pretend that these offshore entities really belong to them when in fact they don't. I mean, the, the rules for foreign corporations in the U.S. are pretty strict. I mean, if you own a sliver of a foreign corporation that's deemed to be an American entity and it's treated like a pass-through, there's all these tax rules which basically try to rope in the entire world and all its commerce and then into the U.S. model and then selectively exempt things. Uh, our securities laws do the same thing. The security law, Section 5 of the Securities Act, pretends, if you just read it, it pretends that every securities transaction everywhere in the world is subject to registration with the SEC, and then they exempt things out of that overarching definition. So when you first read it, you're like, what the heck? I mean, if a French person does a deal with a German person in Switzerland, should that be subject to U.S. jurisdiction? Well, if you just read the law, uh, it covers interstate commerce, but interstate commerce also covers commerce between the states and any foreign country. And if it's on the internet, doesn't touch the U.S. states somehow? I mean, it's hard to know. So, yeah, I mean, people, some people are just, you know, they're born in town, they're going to stay in the town, they never leave, they never even think about it, think about it. But the, the bar for being international keeps on following and following and following, and more people are being pulled into this international tribe just because it's, it's easier to be part of that tribe. It's kind of the default. So it's an interesting time. So um, you will be speaking at uh, the conference, uh, and what are you going to be talking about? So my, my topics tend to be technical legal subjects, I've, I've been told, even though I, I think I bring some creativity to them. They're, they're specifically, I'm looking at Regulation A+, and how it relates to crypto. We're on the cusp of having true security tokens or tokenized securities. Um, everyone claims that they're issuing, doing STOs, security token offerings. We haven't really seen STOs in the United States yet. Everyone's talking about it, but it hasn't happened, mostly as a function of our laws. Um, Regulation A plus is a law that's been on the books for the while for a while, but it just got really improved in 2015. The it allows a miniature IPO, like a, a miniature initial public offering but without all the registration and ongoing uh, compliance requirements of a full IPO. And Blockstack uh, is a company they just filed with SEC for permission to conduct a first Reg A plus for crypto or for tokenized securities. They haven't been improved yet, but it looks like it's going to be improved. Now, I'm not deep diving so much on the Blockstack application, but Reg A plus opens up some real possibilities for doing public offerings of crypto, of secured, uh, security tokens in the United States. And the law needs to evolve, the law needs to change, there's just no doubt about it, but Reg A plus is maybe a way to sort of meet in the middle between securitized tokens or tokenized securities and public offerings. So it's, it's an interesting time. And uh, the, do you see uh, the corresponding uh, infrastructure developing uh, as it needs to in terms of uh, um, uh, exchanges for uh, these uh, um, tokenized securities, uh, the secondary markets that, uh, of course, broaden uh, mm -hmm. and over, override uh, any uh, previous restrictions, potentially on ownership or, or transfer of, of these tokens? <sighs> like everything else in this field, it's in progress, but it's not here yet, and it's been that way for a while, and it's a little bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's truth. Mm -hmm. the, um, it's all, all these companies are, they're funded, they're developing things, but they're banging their heads against this outdated regulatory model. And the regulatory model is beginning to slightly, slightly bend and adapt, but it's not doing it enough, and it's not doing it quickly enough. I, I, think, I think the US is at a, significant is going to be is at and is going to be at a significant competitive disadvantage unless we update the law. Now, the reason everyone keeps on troubling and even bothering with the US is because that's where the money is and that's yeah. where the customers is. So, you know, this like, you know, uh, Dillinger, the famous bank robber was asked, why do you rob banks? And he goes, well, because that's where the money is. So, you know, obviously, crypto is not robbing banks, but the US is where the money is. It just it just is. Um, Reg A plus has a unique challenge, which is the the, you need to engage a transfer agent 
that's approved by the SEC in order to engage in these transactions. And there's other rules you have to follow. Well, it's we don't really have transfer agents that are good for blockchain and for security token offerings yet. So that's sort of a, a firewall or a, a block on what's happening. But if the SEC gets its act together and approves these transactions, then we'll have those. I, I think within the year we're going to have it. Well, uh, maybe sooner than a year or within the year. And uh, then why don't we or meet? Before the end of the year, I should say. Why don't we meet in uh, November 2019 here in Malta mm -hmm. at the November edition of uh, the uh, Blockchain Summit and see what uh, the next six months uh, have uh, uh, meant. And hopefully uh, there will be a lot of positive uh, developments uh, from the point of view of the various uh, blockchain projects, from the point of view of the regulatory uh, readiness, and uh, you will tell me all about it. Sounds great. Thank Look you. Look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs>